The title of my lecture today links together two Marian titles, Totopulcra and Immaculate Conception. My argument explores the theological relationship uh, between them. Just this past summer, the famous statue of the Virgin Mary atop the golden dome of the main building here at Notre Dame was regilded. Since Mary in that statue is clearly depicted as the Immaculate Conception, crushing the head of the serpent, the moon under her feet, it's a fitting moment to recall that Immaculate Conception is actually one of Mary's names, and not just the technical title for the Marian dogma as it was defined in 1854. When St. Bernadette asked the beautiful lady at Lourdes in 1858 to name herself, the Virgin Mary told her, I am the Immaculate Conception. There is nonetheless a certain awkwardness in using Immaculate Conception as a title to name Mary. Have any of you ever begun a prayer to the Blessed Mother with the words, Dear Immaculate Conception? <laughs> I suspect not. One more easily calls her Immaculata, which has become an actual personal name in the vernacular. Or it's easier to sing to her as Immaculate Mary. Or to invoke her as Mary conceived without sin. A certain awkwardness also attends the first name given to Mary in the title of this lecture, Toda Pulcra a Latin phrase that means completely beautiful, beautiful through and through. A personal name or nickname can be an adjective, but we usually refer to names as nouns, not adjectives. Mary is toda pulcra, but when was the last time you addressed your husband with the words, hey, handsome, or how recently have you said to your wife, good morning, beautiful? Or when was the last time you sang to her the song by Hank Williams, Hey, Good Lookin'? <laughs> <laughs> Used as names, the adjectives handsome, beautiful, good looking are unusual, almost ungrammatical. So, the title of this lecture joins together two somewhat ungrammatical names for Our Lady, Totopulcra and Immaculate Conception. What links the two together is actually a third, highly unusual expression, gratia plena, full of grace. In Greek, kekaratomene. The expression gratia plena appears in the New Testament, Biblia Vulgata, in the first chapter of the Gospel according to Luke, whereas tota pulcra can be found in the Old Testament book, the Song of Songs. The exact phrase, immaculate conception, cannot be found in the Bible. It emerges from the church's tradition. It was first applied to Mary, it seems, by the Catalan theologian Ramon Lull in the early 14th century, when Blessed John Den Scotus was also laying the theological groundwork for that Marian dogma. Putting these three Marian names together, Toda Pulcra, Grazia Plena, and Immaculate Conception, an interesting picture emerges. Toda and plena both refer to a complete fullness. And the word for grace, gratia, includes the meaning of beauty, of something charming, 
pulchritudinous. One speaks, for ex example, of a graceful movement or gesture, of a gracious hostess. The word immaculate also references beauty, but in a privative way. The beautiful one is without spot, stainless, perfectly beautiful, because without any deformity. A perduring philosophical debate concerns whether beauty is inherent in the object that calls to us, attracts us, or whether beauty is strictly in the eye of the beholder. We sometimes wonder, what does she see in him? But if God is the beholder, there's no distinction between the beauty in God's eye and the beauty in the object, which owes its very existence to God. What God sees is. What God creates is inherently good. And the word forma in Latin means figure, shape, appearance, beauty. Everything is beautiful in its own way, as the song title tells us. Our existence is itself gratuitous, a matter of grace and beauty. The more a person sees as God sees, the more beautiful each and everything appears. Father Zosima in Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov teaches that we are actually living in paradise, but don't realize it, because we do not see the world as God does, as God created it to be. We don't perceive its beauty. Seeing Mary in her beauty, the church has been drawn into God's own vision of her. Mary sings in her Magnificat, for the Almighty has looked upon the lowliness of his servant, Luke 1, 48. Mary rejoices because God has noticed her in her humility. He has seen her, regarded her, and she is beautiful in his eyes. In the Magnificat, Mary sees herself as she is reflected in the eye of God. And God sees his own image and likeness reflected in her. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. God wants us to do the same, to look upon Mary, so that we can see and feel her maternal concern for us, her children in Christ, so that we can see ourselves as she sees us. Speaking from the cross, Jesus himself instructed Mary to look upon the apostle John as her son. And, she told, and he told John, behold your mother. Jesus wanted the beloved disciple to see Mary as he himself saw her, as his own dear mother, Toda Pulchra. The church has taken these words of the dying Jesus as the Lord's will and testament, his gift of Mary as mother to the church and to every child of the church. Indeed, his gift of Mary as mother to all of humanity. To behold Mary, our mother, is to regain a sense of our own dignity and beauty as beloved children of God, our value to God who has ransomed us at a very great price. What did God see when he looked upon Mary at Nazareth? In Mary, the immaculate conception and humble handmaid, God saw his own image and likeness with incomparable clarity, shining in the soul of her whom we praise as the mirror of justice, speculum justitiae. Here at last, 
Christ, the second Adam, could find a suitable helpmate. In the Gospel according to St. Luke, a Gospel originally composed in Greek, the Archangel Gabriel does not greet Mary at the hour of the Annunciation with the words, Hail Mary, full of grace. He does not pronounce the personal name Mary. Instead, the angel hails her as full of grace, as if the word kekaratomene is her personal name, hail full of grace, or hail highly favored. <coughs> the evangelist reports that Mary was greatly troubled, not at the appearance of an angel, but at the angel's unusual greeting. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and considered in her mind what sort of greeting this might be, Luke 1, 29. As Father Francois Rosier explains, Kekaratomene, a per perfect passive feminine singular participle, is found in the angel's greeting, quote, where we would expect the name of the person greeted, unquote. As a perfect participle, it refers to an action already accomplished. Mary has been graced. That is who she is, the one who has been perfectly, completely graced. Used as evocative, the exact expression, kekaratomene, appears only once in the sacred scriptures. As a name for Mary, it and here I'm quoting Father Rossier, gives evidence of the very essence of her person. It pertains to the very identity of Mary. In all of scripture, it is reserved to Mary as if it were her special mark, unquote. The angel's awesome, highly unusual greeting, which at first frightens Mary, reveals to her that she had been graced from the very beginning and set apart. Why? In order to prepare her to be able to fulfill her singular privileged destiny as mother of God and helpmate of her divine son. When her cousin Elizabeth declares, blessed are you among women, Luke 1 confirming the gift of Mary's election, Mary replies with her Magnificat, my soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Reflecting on Mary's words, Monsignor Charles Journet writes, quote, we would think that it was at this moment that she became conscious with wonderment in her heart of her own immaculate conception. In a long, important 1958 essay, Scripture and the Immaculate Conception, A Problem in the Evolution of Dogma, an essay written for a conference held right here at Notre Dame in 1954, Journet takes up a theme important to St. John Cardinal, John Cardinal Henry Newman, namely the development of dogma. Journey explains that the sacred scriptures, inspired by the Holy Spirit, contain all the Christian doctrines concerning the Virgin Mary and the Church, quote, in an implicit, preconceptual, and unformulated state, unquote. The same Holy Spirit who has inspired the biblical writers and who filled the apostles also works in the faithful quote, inclining them to embrace these implicit Christian truths even before they are promulgated as dogmas and giving the faithful a presentiment of the church's definitions, unquote. In keeping with a long Jewish and Christian exegetical tradition, the letter of the scriptures is considered to contain hints and clues that prompt a deeper meditative investigation Considered in the light of faith, awkward and unusual expressions, such as the angel's way of greeting Mary, 
yield a more profound understanding of the hidden mysteries of the faith that the word of God actually imparts to us, scripture interpreting scripture. In the papal bull declaring the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, Pope Pius IX cites biblical passages that witness to Mary's sinlessness, her preservation from, through the merits of Jesus Christ, the savior of the human race, from every stain of original sin. These passages include Genesis 3.15, which prophesies the victory of the new Eve and the second Adam over the old serpent. The scenes of the Annunciation and Visitation in Luke 1, but also a host of Old Testament types and images in which the fathers of the church had discovered a revelation of Mary Immaculate. So where do we find these? According to um, Pius IX, in that Ark of Noah, which was built by divine command and escaped entirely safe and sound from the common shipwreck of the whole world. In the ladder, which Jacob saw reaching from the earth to heaven, by whose rungs the angels of God ascended and descended, and on whose top the Lord God himself leaned, Genesis 28. In that bush, which Moses saw in the holy place burning on all sides, which was not consumed or injured in any way, but grew green and blossomed beautifully, Exodus 3.2. And in that impregnable tower before the enemy, from which hung a thousand bucklers and all the armor of the strong, Song of Songs 4.4. 4. In the garden enclosed on all sides, which cannot be violated or corrupted by any deceitful plots, Song of Songs 4.12 as in that resplendent city of God, which has its foundations on the holy mountains, Psalm 87, 1. In that most august temple of God, which radiant with divine splendors is full of the glory of God, Isaiah 6, the first four verses. And in many other biblical types of this kind. I was, my colleague Brian Daly used to say, scripture has a very special way of talking about Mary, a peculiar way, addiction. So the closing words at the end of this list signal a fullness, a plenitude of images from various books of the Bible, all of which can be used to understand better the surpassing mystery of Mary's grace and beauty, which exceeds our power of expression because it touches so closely upon God's own holiness. Toda pulchra is a phrase from Song of Songs 411, which reads in its entirety, Toda pulchra es amica mea, et macula non est in te. You are completely beautiful, my love, and there is no spot in you. Echoing this phrase, Toda pulchra is also the incipit of an ancient Christian prayer to Mary dating from the fourth century. On the screen, you can see the Latin words. I read the English translation. You are all beautiful, Mary, and the original stain of sin is not in you. You are the glory of Jerusalem. You are the joy of Israel. You give honor to our people. You are an advocate of sinners, O Mary. Virgin, most intelligent. Mother, most merciful. Plead for us. Plead for us to the Lord Jesus Christ. This ancient prayer echoes Israel's praise of Judith, the honor of her people. It witnesses to the church's belief that Mary was without personal sin and free from any stain of the original sin, namely the stain of concupiscence that inclines us, inclines us even after we have received the grace of Christ in baptism to desire lesser goods over the higher, highest goods, to love in a disordered way and thus to turn away from God in sin. 
the question whether or not Mary had first inherited original sin at her conception and then been freed from it and its effects afterwards while still in her mother's womb was a question that was first explicitly raised, it seems, during St. Augustine's disputes with the Pelagians. Clearly, many devotees of the Virgin Mary in the ancient world and in the Middle Ages, St. Bernard among them, thought of Mary as personally sinless, as someone full of grace and mediating grace for others, and therefore, tota pulchra, without Without, 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 they did, they called her that, without believing in the Immaculate Conception as we now do. I don't want to go into all of the particulars of the medieval theological debates about Mary's sanctification or her Immaculate Conception here. Let it suffice to say that Dun Scotus's argument about Mary's Immaculate Conception proved to be persuasive among theologians in ever widening circles and had already been implicitly embraced by the faithful who celebrated the feast of the conception of Mary in England and elsewhere. In the confusion following the Council of Basel, Pope Sixtus IV approved the celebration in Rome of that Marian feast in the 15th century. Although the doctrine of Mary's Immaculate Conception still had its theological opponents, chiefly among the Dominicans. The so-called Maculist upheld Mary's sanctification. The Immaculist upheld Mary's Immaculate Conception. Seeking to preserve the church's unity, the Magisterian instructed that both were to be re regarded as pious views. The sensum fidelium, however, inclined increasingly to the understanding that Mary's fullness of grace extended all the way back to the first moment of her existence, so that she was never at any time of her life, even for a moment, without Christ's saving grace. During the time that stretched from the 15th century to the 19th, when the Immaculate Conception was finally declared a dogma, on December 8, 1854, Catholic artists sought to portray Mary's exterior and interior beauty, her fullness of grace. They gave expression to their belief in Mary's Immaculate Conception by depicting it in art. Since the dogma concerns Mary's preservation from the stain of original sin from the first moment of her existence in her mother's womb, these artists faced an extraordinary challenge. Like Fra Angelico, many Im Immaculates who painted the scene of the, of the Annunciation did so taking the angel's words, hail full of grace, as a biblical warrant for the Immaculate Conception. But Maculist artists also painted the Annunciation to express their belief that the Virgin Mary had been sanctified in an extraordinary way sometime after her conception and in this way freed from the slightest stirrings of concupiscence. The depictions of the Annunciation were thus seen to be somewhat ambiguous in what they were actually declaring about Mary's fullness of grace and beauty. Art historians agree that the so-called tota pulchra paintings, of which there are very many examples from the 16th and 17th centuries, give the clearest indication of the artist's affirmation of Mary's Immaculate Conception. So let's pause and take a short glance at three examples um, from the 16th century Spain. And I'm not gonna talk, I'm just gonna show you the pictures. As you can see, these paintings are word pictures. At the top, there is typically a scroll in which the words from Song of Songs 411 can be read. Tota pulcra es amica mea et maculanon est in te. 
You are completely beautiful, my love. There's no spot in you. Sometimes the three divine persons are depicted above the words so that the quoted passage appears as the word of God addressed to the Virgin Mary, whose figure is central to the painting. Surrounding the figure of Mary are multiple biblical and liturgical images, each of them labeled with an identifying scroll. The sheer multiplicity of images gives expression to the surpassing fullness of Mary's grace and beauty, which no single image suffices to express. As the iconography becomes familiar to viewers, the images began, begin to appear without the accompanying labels, as in this early 17th century painting by Miguel Bastar, entitled Immaculada Concepcion. Or, in the painting we viewed earlier by an artist of the Cusco School. So the angels here are, are carrying the different uh, emblems or icons. If we pause to look at the individual symbols in one of these Totopulcra paintings, we can recognize in them some of the biblical images explicitly mentioned by Pope Pius IX in Ineffabilis Deus, the document promulgating the dogma. For example, the sealed fountain, the city of God, the tower of David hung with protecting shields. As you can see, many of these images are taken from the Song of Songs, where the beloved of God is named in poetic ways. But some of them also echo the books of Sirach, of Wisdom, and of Revelation. These books were and are used in the liturgy for Marian feasts and have inspired Marian anthems, such as the Alma Redem Taurus Mater, sung during Advent and Christmastide, Ave Regina Celorum, sung during Lent, and Ave Stella Maris, usually sung at Vespers. So you can see the list here. Uh, bright as the sun, fair as the moon, star of the sea, tower of David, exalted cedar, garden enclosed, fair olive tree, fountain sealed, city of God, spotless mirror, mystical rose, gate of heaven, beautiful palm tree, beautiful as lilies, lily among thorns. Read in a list, these total pulchra images easily become a litany in which we call on Mary, asking her to pray for us. So we could say, for instance, Mary, bright as the sun, pray for us. The litany of Loretto, dating from 1531 and approved by Pope Sixtus V in 1587, includes some of these titles as invocations. Mirror of Justice, Mystical Rose, Gate of Heaven, Tower of David. Pope St. John Paul II added two titles to the litany, Mother of the Church, 1980, and Queen of Families, 1995. In June 2020, Pope Francis added three more titles to the litany of Loretto, Mother of Mercy, Mother of Hope, Solace of Migrants, This fresco from the Cathedral of Bayeux, inspired by the Litany of Loretto, clearly resembles the Toda Polka paintings. The words on the scroll at the top reads, Gloriosa dicta sunt dete, glorious things are said of you, Psalm 87.3. Seeing Mary at the center, surrounded by symbols for her various titles, might also remind you of artistic depictions of the scene at Pentecost, where Mary, located centrally, 
intercedes for and receives the outpoured gift of the Holy Spirit together with the apostles. Or one might think of one of those paintings or sculptures of the Virgin of the Mantle, the Mater Ecclesiae. Mary has singular privileges, but as St. Therese of Lisieux taught, she's a mother and she shares her grace with us. Mary shares her fullness of grace, her beauty with her children. In chapter eight of Lumen Gentium, Vatican II's dogmatic constitution on the church, 1964, the Virgin Mary, mother of God, is described as quote, the mother of the members of Christ, unquote. The beloved mother of Christ and mother of men, particularly of the faithful, paragraph 54. The church's model and excellent exemplar of virtues, paragraph 53. A sign of sure hope and solace for the pilgrim people of God, paragraph 68. If we are children of Mary, in and through Christ, it follows that each of us somehow resembles our mother Mary, mother of the church. Pope Pius X, in his encyclical, Adiam Illum Laetitissimum, February 2nd, 1904, writes about Mary's intimate, living knowledge of Christ, her son, as a vitalis Christi cognitio, a warm knowledge, a living knowledge that she imparts to us as our mother and educator. A long tradition within the church speaks of our incorporation into Christ's mystical body, the church, as affecting a quasi-physical union with Christ and with each other due to the mystery of the incarnation in Mary's womb and to Christ's real presence, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. Mary's womb was Christ's first church on earth. And she herself, as St. Francis of Assisi names her, is the virgin made church. Thanks to her unbroken faith at the foot of the cross, the power of her hope, the fullness of her love. In accord with Mary's plan, excuse me, in accord with God's plan, Mary's fullness of grace, won for her by Christ, mysteriously overflows into all the sacraments of the church. Hence, our incorporation into Christ is also, as Alain de Lille taught in the 12th century, an incorporation into Mary, a participation in her faith, hope, and love, in her spiritual and physical closeness to Christ, in her hearing, in her bearing and bringing of Christ into the world. Because of Mother Mary, Christ is the firstborn of many brothers and sisters, Romans 8.29. Writ large, the fullness of Mary's beauty is that of Christ's church in all its members. The multiplication of Mary's names and titles hints at the Marian names of her children. Sacred scripture speaks of a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Revelations 2.17. Father Joseph Kantonick, the founder of the International Schoenstatt Work, encouraged his followers to consider which of Mary's many titles, symbols, names, and virtues appealed most to them, and to choose a Marian ideal as a guiding star for their striving for holiness. He reasoned that God is calling each of us by name, by a name that is ultimately a Marian name, in accord with God's immaculate conception of her. A prayer in Trinidad's spiritual tradition recalls the Totopulchra. So let's um, pray together uh, in conclusion. Mother, you are beautiful. Gladly my heart turns to you. My greatest joy shall ever be to form your image within me until your features, one by one, are reflected in my being. 
so the Father happily sees your image within me and full of joy at my life's end, calls me his child, and by your name, Maria. Thank you.